The requirements were not met due to reactor overworking prior to the test. The results would be irrelevant. Yet, the management gave the orders to later report it as successful. Why? Because they would receive a praise for officially commissioning the 4th RBMK reactor. That's what they were thinking about, mostly. But in return, it started a chain reaction which led to the events we know today as the Chernobyl disaster. Hello guys! Last time we talked about another two important operators involved in Chernobyl disaster. One was Anatoly Sitnikov, who was a high-ranking power plant manager and deputy chief engineer. The other was much younger Alexandr Yuvchenko, who had already been promoted to senior engineer. We also covered Toptunov, Akimov, Dyatlov, Khodemchuk and Stolyarchuk. Two of those seven people lived many years after the disaster, including Stolyarchuk, whom we haven't seen for a few years since his interview in 2018, yet we believe he's okay despite the war in Ukraine. Today, we're gonna introduce you to another important person who was in the very center of the whole disaster. One of three people held responsible during the Chernobyl trial. One of two people in charge of the whole Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Let's start. Chernobyl victims. The management. Part 1. Nikolai Maksimovich Fomin. Born in Novo Ekonomiczne, Donetsk Oblast, in the Ukrainian SSR in 1937. He was the chief engineer of the plant when the disaster happened. It meant that he was a direct subordinate only to one person, director Viktor Brukhanov. He was one of the first Communist Party members to arrive at the destroyed Unit 4 at about 4.30 am on April 26, 1986. Despite being so close to the open reactor, Nikolai didn't suffer as much as other people present there at that time. Due to the turmoil on the Ukrainian soil caused by the Russians, we don't know how he's doing in the recent times. But just a few years back, he was supposedly a tour guide around the zone. He should be 86, 87 years old now. We don't know his precise birth date. So, why was he so important back in the 70s and 80s? First of all, we lack a lot of information about his background, early life and education. Some of the sources state that he didn't get a university-like education in the nuclear engineering field, rather a correspondence course. Before he moved to Pripyat because of his new job at Chernobyl, he worked at Poltava Energy Grid and Zaporozhia Thermal Power Station. One of the reasons I still believe that he was a product of the Soviet system is that he blindly repeated a lot of propaganda slogans. In a documentary from 2004, his co-workers stated, Fomin used to say that the chance of any malfunction is absolutely minimal, similar to a chance of being hit by a meteorite, when asked about the RBMK. It is true that he was indeed a party man. He was a member of the Communist Party, which was not something easy to achieve. Despite a lot of people in the Soviet Union were involved in the party life, the number of members was quite limited. So Nikolai had to be found it useful or dedicated or loyal to the party at some point to achieve a full membership. That's also a reason why a lot of people working at Chernobyl thought that he achieved the second most important job at the power plant through political connections and his other responsibilities as a party's local secretary. That happened in 1983, about three years before the disaster. During that time, one of his most important tasks was to make sure every Soviet plan was on schedule. That was not easy, because of how the system worked. Party officials and ministers in Moscow almost never had the real information, but rather the false reports made because of the impossible quotas. That was a vicious circle. Moscow officials raised quotas because of the reports, which were made up stated that the quotas were met and even overachieved. So, next time, officials raised the quotas. If the plan was going so well, why not? 
This made the Soviet economy enormously overrated and extremely vulnerable to any disorder. Partially, that fear of meeting or creating any obstacles made the management of Chernobyl allow for the turbine safety test to be performed. If you don't know that, the test required a particular maintenance of the reactor for some time before it was performed. But due to getting close to end of the month, which was the time when every factory, power plant and other production facilities sent reports to Moscow to say how good they were doing. This meant a lot of these facilities were in dire need of electricity, so the reactor number 4 had to work over the scheduled maintenance which would allow a better safety of the test. But that's not even the worst part. The test results, even if positive, would be of no use. The whole point of testing was to show that in case of emergency, the turbines would be powered by diesel engines and the reactor could be shut down safely. When the requirements were not met due to reactor overworking prior to the test, the results would be irrelevant. But if they would be reported as successful, the management would receive a praise for officially commissioning the 4th RBMK reactor. Yet, they started a chain reaction which led to the events we know today as the Chernobyl disaster. So, as you may see, Nikolai Fomin was in the center of those events, yet we can't say it was purely his, or others, fault for the RBMK number 4 exploding on that fatal night, on April 26, 1986. Nikolai was not very lucky. In 1985, he was hurt during car accident and was partially paralyzed for several weeks. He got back to work exactly a month before the disaster has happened. When it did, he was notified two and a half hour after by Boris Rogoshkin, chief of the night shift of the power plant. During the time when the whole Soviet apparatus was involved in dealing with the disaster, Nikolai was hidden from the public view. Officially, he was arrested in August 19th, but we don't really know what happened with him during these four months. He was kept in the prison for almost a year before the infamous Chernobyl trial began on July the 7th, 1987. It was to begin quicker, but Fomin suffered from a mental breakdown and tried to commit suicide using his broken glasses. They waited until doctors stated he's capable of answering all the questions he will be asked during the trial. When it finally started, Fomin mostly tried to avoid any blame being associated with his name. His finger pointed at the operators, who deviated from the test plan, as he put it. Despite that being true, he didn't mention that he allowed the test to be performed even though the test requirements were not met, and that this made the operators deviate from the plan. From the recordings of the trial, we can see that Fomin looked different than the two other defendants, Brukanov and Dyatlov. His facial expressions were stiff, limited. He answered with a dull and steady voice, sometimes cracking a bit. We don't know if he was sedated or given any medicine to help with his psychological trauma, but it's not impossible. Of course, as you may guess, even without knowing the story, he was found guilty. Because of the state of his mental health, he received multiple treatments while in prison and later was transferred to a psychiatric hospital in 1988. Shortly after, a team of doctors diagnosed him with a reactive psychosis and treated until 1990, when his family forced him to be transferred yet again to a civilian psychiatric hospital. After he was released some years later, it was quite strange he has found a job in the same industry. He worked in Kaliningskaya nuclear power plant until sometime around the year 2000, when he retired. Later, he was supposedly often working as a tour guide in the Chernobyl exclusion zone, which, <laughs> to be fair, 
would be quite interesting to experience. After all, he was one of the people who really saw it with their own eyes and spent over 15 years there, so he must have known every single interesting point. Other sources state that he lives quietly with his family in Udomlia, a Russian town north of Moscow, halfway to Petersburg. What do you think of Fomin? If you read about the disaster history and dug through the important background of the whole Soviet system, how would you judge him? I'm very interested in what you think about this person, who was so closely involved in the disaster, yet not exactly the only responsible man. Leave a comment. Also, write down what you think we should cover next. We are producing several episodes right now, so we probably won't change everything planned for the next week, yet I'm closely monitoring your suggestions and keeping a list of what would you like to hear about in the future. Anyhow, we have reached the end of this episode. Be sure to watch the previous ones, and if you do, do it from the very beginning to the very end. It really helps us regarding the YouTube algorithm. That's it for today, guys. Take care, stay safe, and see you next week. <laughs>